Yesterday was Australia Day for you. I'm not sure you were even aware that it's also Republic Day in India. The 26th of January every year is Republic Day. Growing up in Delhi, we attended the Republic Day Parade all the time. So this will be an appropriate segue into my message this morning. <clears throat> this Indian guy had just gone in for an interview for a job. They were going to get about five positions for about 500 who were applying for it, as often happens in India. So he goes to the interview and comes out. And as he was walking out, the interviewer said, don't repeat the questions to anybody because the same questions for everyone. So he walks out, and of course, one of the Indian guys said, what are the questions, what are the questions? He said, I'm not allowed to tell you. He said, okay, if you don't want to tell me the questions, at least give me the answers. <laughs> what were the answers? <clears throat> so he said, well, the first answer was when uh, about uh, uh, the question he was actually asked was, when did India gain its independence? And his answer was that many, many things happened. There were several events that took place all kinds of events and activities and so on. And then finally, India got its independence in 1947. So he gave them, gave them the first answer. The second question happened to be, who is the father of the nation? And this fellow told the interviewers, you know, it's not fair to just name one person when so many others are involved in this kind of thing. Why should I just pick one man? So I'll say there were several involved in this. So the interviewer is rather impressed and said, our third question for you is, is corruption a major problem in India? And this follows answer was that, uh, you know, the matter is under study. The prime minister has committed a delegation to study this. And when the results are out, we'll be able to give you a more certain answer for that. <laughs> so he said, oh, wow, that's pretty good. So he gave this fellow the three answers. Many things took place, a lot of activities. And then 1947, it all came together. Who am I to call one person father? Many were enrolled and so on. The matter is being studied by a prime minister committee. He gave him the three answers. So the fellow walks in. And the interviewer is going through his form. He says, you know, this is not complete. Uh, what is your date of birth? <laughs> he says, actually, many activities took place long before. And there were a lot of things that went on and on. But it all finally came together in 1947. <laughs> he said, uh, what is your father's name? He says, who am I to pick one man? You know, so many people involved in this. And he goes on and on and on. So one of the interviewers says, are you off your head? Are you crazy? He said, well, the prime minister has appointed a committee to study the question, and I'll let you know afterwards. You know, in apologetics, oftentimes you can give a lot of answers and have nothing to do with the questions. The questions are totally from a completely different context. And that's why it is so important when even a question like this is raised, a simple question with profound implications why Jesus? Why Jesus? When there's such a plurality of worldviews out there, in the pantheon of Hinduism alone, there are 330 million gods and counting. That's in Hinduism alone. India has spawned most of the major religions in the world in the last 15, 1600 years. Uh, Hinduism, for example, uh, claiming adherence of about 80% of India and many converts in other parts of the world. Uh, Islam, if India and Pakistan had not separated, India would be the largest Muslim nation in the world. Now it happens to be Indonesia, but if India and Pakistan's numbers are joined together, it'd be the largest Islamic nation in the world. Uh, Buddhism was born, were nurtured and raised in India. Jainism, Sikhism, it's a country of great philosophical thought. And oftentimes, I marvel at the fact that the first person who went to India to preach the gospel was the man to whom Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. That's the Apostle Thomas. And when Thomas himself was not sure of all of this until he had met the risen Christ, it is Christ who looks at him and says to him, take your hand and feel my side. He knew the side of his Lord had been thrusted by a spear. He was aware of that. And then he bent his knee and in those profound words that come to us in the Greek, ho kuriosmu, ho theosmu, my Lord and my God. And of all the place in the world that he chose to go, he went to a land with 330 million deities and many others only to say there is a way, a truth, and the life, and that comes through the person of Jesus Christ. He paid for his life 
having been speared to death himself. There's a memorial to the Apostle Thomas in the city of Chennai, and there's a commemoration to his visit in Kerala, where he first set foot on Indian soil in a little place called Kodalungur, which is right there to this very day, and the marker given. Jesus had a conversation with all of the ideas converging into the question. Ethnicity, political powers, religious issues, and all the machinations that human minds can bring together in order to justify what they're about to do. So he's standing now in front of Pontius Pilate, and here's the conversation between them. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Notice how often Jesus answers a question with a question. Mm -hmm. You notice that? And the reason he does that is not to trick his opponent, but you see, when you question your questioner, you open them up within their own assumptions. And it determines the entry point of the discussion. When a man came to J Jesus, you know, and uh, uh, Ray raised him a question, with him a question, and he said, good master, what must I do to attain eternal life? You and I immediately would have given the way of salvation. And said, so Jesus looked at him and said, why are you calling me good? When there's none good but God. Are you calling me God? If you're calling me God, will you listen to me? Or do you actually think there can be goodness without God? See, he's opening the man up within his own assumptions because intent is prior to content. George MacDonald said to give truth to him who loves it not is only to give him more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. To give truth to him who loves it not is only to give him more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. And the uh, people who are antagonists are brilliant at manipulating conversations and getting more multiplied reasons for misinterpretation. So here's Jesus looking at him. You're asking me if I'm the king of the Jews? Is this your own idea or did others set you up to ask me this? Pilate looks at him and says, look, am I a Jew? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you've done? He's pitting ethnicity against ethnicity Political power against political power. Your people brought you here. Your people have accused you. And you're asking me if I'm setting this question up on my own or has somebody else set me up for it? Jesus then gives him a profound answer. Jesus said, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Ah, you are a king then, said Pilate. Now here's Jesus' comprehensive response. You are right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate raised the most important question in life, but did not wait for the answer. What is truth, said he, and turned and walked away. What irony that he's standing in front of one who was the incarnation of truth, the embodiment of truth, and if his intention were honorable, the least he would have done is waited to hear how exactly Jesus would answer the question. But he says, what is kind of, kind of a, you know, in a cavalier way, ah, what is truth? Turned round and walked away. You and I can do the same. You and I can do the same. If we really want the truth, the Bible says when you abide in his word, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. If somebody is truly pursuing the truth, the least they ought to do is give Jesus a hearing on what it is he says about life, its essence and its destiny. And if you have never done that before in your life, I urge you to give him a chance in asking your questions, maybe by turning to the Gospel of John sometime, sitting down, asking your questions, and asking him if he's really the way, the truth, and the life, to speak to you indeed. You know, it is ironically in a conversation with Thomas in John chapter 14 that led to my own conversion to Jesus Christ, along a path of many options and then on a bed of suicide. And Jesus said, because I live, you also shall live. Now, why is Jesus the way, the truth, and the life? 
W.H. Lecky, the great French historian, in his book, A History of European Morals from Augustus to Charlemagne II, said this, and Lecky was a skeptic. Here's what he says. The character of Jesus has not only been the highest pattern of virtue, but the strongest incentive in its practice, and has exerted so deep an influence that it may be truly said that the simple record of three short years of active life has done more to regenerate and to soften mankind than all the disquisitions of philosophers and all the exhortations of moralists. Quite a tribute by W.E.H. Lecky. In response to that comment, the famed New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce said this, that is a non-Christian, or at least a not distinctly Christian judgment of one sense in which Jesus is not only a historical figure, but also our eternal contemporary, his influence lives on. Remarkable tribute by a historian followed up by a great theologian. How his influence lives on when you think of him in those few short years that his teaching on values and ethics uh, exceeds all of those disquisitions and deliberations of thinkers and philosophers. I could come at this historically, I could come at this philosophically, I could come at this textually, argumentatively, I'm choosing a simple way which I think is the most relevant way, existentially, in your experience what is it about the answers of Jesus Christ that puts it all together for you and me? And I'm sure at some point, if not at all points, you'll find a connection that his answers are rather profound and indisputable. The first is this, his description of the human condition is most in keeping with the reality of your experience and mine. His description of the human condition None of us rises above this. When the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, there is not merely a standard, but there is a purpose for which life was intended, and all of us fall short. You know, uh, I remember the year 2000, speaking for Billy Graham in Amsterdam, and there were 10,000 evangelists from all over the world, over 100 language groups represented, and you're speaking through simultaneous interpreters, carrying it in all of the languages present out there. So you're staying to your text, and everyone is hearing it in their own language. And you may have heard this story, but it, uh, the thing that amazed me is as soon as that story was concluded, across this vast Rai auditorium, everybody just roaring with laughter, they connected with the illustration. It's the story about these two brothers who are hooligans, rascals, scoundrels, made their money by all deviant means. And all of a sudden, one of them suddenly died. And so the surviving brother didn't know what to do, and he goes over to a local pastor and he says, you know, we've got to have a big funeral. Uh, we're going to have all kinds of dignitaries. My brother and I never went to church, but we'd like to have it in a church. If you don't mind, uh, we'd like to hold it in your church, and would you make your church available? The pastor says, well, you guys never came here. He said, look, uh, we'll, we'll pay you a handsome sum. Just let's do, you use your auditorium. And the pastor says, all right. What do you want me to do? He says, well, we want you to deliver the sermon. He said, but I didn't know your brother. He said, say whatever you want to say, except just to include one line, refer to my brother as a saint. <laughs> and the pastor said, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. He said, look, I'll pay you well. I'll pay you well. Just take care of it. Just one line. What is this? It's saying, and it's, uh, refer to my brother. So the pastor, looking through this guy, thought, oh, I'll take care of this. He said, we'll do it. And all the big guys in town were there, and the man is lying in the coffin. And the pastor begins a sermon. He said, the man you're seeing lying in the coffin here was a scoundrel. He was a hooligan. He was thug, a thug. He was duplicitous. He was de de devious. He did every dirty, rotten, stinking thing you can think of. But compared to his, compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> <clears throat> I know the whole audience just, why? At that point, I'd never been to Africa. Why was the African laughing? <laughs> I'd never been to any other parts of the world. Why were they laughing? Because they all connected with the fact that deep inside, there's that scoundrel-like nature in each one of us, and the story is replete with examples that if the price is right, we go for it. D.L. Moody said, if a man is stealing nuts and bolts from a railway track, and you want to change him so you send him to college, at the end of his education, he will steal the whole railway track. <laughs> 
some of the greatest scoundrels today are the most highly educated and most in the bastions of power. Some of the least are the ones with the fewer things in life and the simplicity of life not to get them sophisticated in their duplicity. Have you ever taken a look at your own heart? Have you ever seen how accurate Jesus is about you and me? You know, I've been in this calling now for four decades. I'm in my 60s now. I've crisscrossed the globe. I preached the gospel from the time I was in my mid-20s. And yet I'm ever surprised at the temptations that will still stalk, still haunt, and you still struggle, and you realize how vulnerable your heart is towards lust, greed, and pride. That's what the Bible says. All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. One of my great heroes was the English journalist Malcolm Muggeridge. I, I think he happened to be the greatest English journalist of the 20th century. It's a toss-up between him and G.K. Chesterton, both latecomers to Christ. But Malcolm Muggeridge taught journalism in India for many years. Yeah, I remember when I had lunch with him shortly before he died, he looked at me and he said, there are many things for which I'll have to ask God for forgiveness. One of them is for just being too fatally fluent. He was brilliant with language, absolutely brilliant. One time editor of Punch magazine. If you've never read any of his speeches or talks, you've missed one of the finest articulators who knew how to use a phrase and turn a phrase and find the most accurate word for a moment of description. There was Muggeridge. He was teaching journalism in India as a young man. Early one morning, he comes out of his room and he goes to the river to have a swim. And he is swimming out there and way out in the distance, he sees an Indian woman. From the distance he could see, she was disrobing, getting into the river for her own bath. And Muggeridge had lived a very indulgent, passionate type life. He decided to swim towards her. With everything within his heart saying, don't do this, don't do this. And he says in his, in his book, The Green Stick a Chronicle of Wasted Years, volume one of his uh, two volume autobiography. He said he was swimming and swimming, something within his heart said, don't, don't. But he said, I was just smothering that voice and kept going towards her. As I came within a few feet of her, he said, I knew that she would be terrified. She'd come alone at sunrise to have this swim of hers. He said, as I, my head emerged from the water, she was astounded to see this was a foreign man coming towards her. And she covered herself like this, just above the waist of her, with the water. And Muggeridge said, I was stunned when I looked into her face to find out I was face to face with a leper. There were no fingers. The nostrils had all worn away. And he started to describe what she looked like. And then he ended with these words. I was thinking to myself, what a lecherous woman. And then I paused and realized, no, it was I who was living with a lecherous heart. <clears throat> you and I need to come to terms with this, sir. We need to come to terms with this. What are your thoughts and intents of the heart deep inside you? The nature of sin is so devious and so deceptive. Malcolm Muggeridge went on to say this, the depravity of man is at the same time the most empirically verifiable fact, even as it is the most intellectually resisted. At the same time, it is the most empirically verifiable fact. You see it all around, it can easily be verified, but at the same time, it is the most intellectually resistant. We like to talk ourselves into believing that man is basically good. Oh yeah, there may be many good things we do, but deep inside, look at the world today. Why is it in the catastrophic mess that it is fiscally, morally, socially, academically, in every sense of the term? We talk about the fiscal cliff. We are the precipitous edge of civilization's self-decimation. We just can't come to terms with how we sit across a table and in cordiality discuss differences and solve our problems. Reason, the heart of man is desperately wicked. I see it again and again and again. 
the description of the human condition. In my next message, I'm going to talk a little more about that, but um, if you walk into Auschwitz today, better be prepared for the most shocking things you'll ever see. One of the most deadly of all death camps under the Nazi regime in Poland. It changed my life. I was in my 20s in my undergraduate work in Toronto when I was invited to go to Vietnam. And I'll never forget the sights I saw. And all that was going on with geopolitical maneuverings at that time. And I thought to myself, is this our answer? Is this the best answer we really have for our issues? Burning each other up, slaughtering each other. Some hospitals were so full that unless you had burns in your body, they were putting two soldiers to each bed. That's what the human condition is like. Now, our mistake is thinking that that is the extreme. We never get there. But the reality is, Jesus said, a sin in your life and sin in mine. I don't know if I have that quotation here. Yes, I do. Here it is. Hobart Maurer, the great psychologist who was an atheist who committed suicide at the age of, um, I think he was in his uh, 70s or something when he committed suicide. Uh, he was uh, 75 years old, one-time professor at Harvard, one-time professor at Yale, president of the American Psychological Association. He wrote this article in the American Psychologist, and he said this. He said he never received more hate mail than after he wrote this article, even though he was a skeptic himself. He said, for several decades, we psychologists have looked upon the whole matter of sin and moral accountability as a great incubus and acclaimed our liberation from sin as epoch-making. See what he's saying? When we no longer were allowed to use the word sin, we consider it so liberating, it was epoch-making. But at length, we have discovered that to be free from sin, to have the excuse of being sick rather than being sinful, is to also court the danger of becoming lost. This danger is, I believe, betokened by the widespread interest in existentialism, which we are presently witnessing, in becoming amoral, ethically neutral, and free. We have cut the very roots of our being, lost our deeper sense of selfhood and identity, and with neurotics now for themselves, we find ourselves asking, who am I? What is my deepest destiny? What does living really mean? And then he ends with the Anna Russell psychiatric folk song. At three, I had a feeling of ambivalence towards my brothers, and so it follows naturally I poisoned all my lovers, and now I'm happy I have learned the lesson this has taught, that everything I do that's wrong is someone else's fault. <laughs> when we thought we were liberated from it, we're sick, not really being sinful. Ah, it was a landmark in psychological theory. He said, what's happened as a result, we've lost the definition of who we really are. The Bible is very clear. Your heart, my heart, is desperately wicked. But what's the remedy for it? In the Judeo-Christian faith, the only answer ever given that I think meets meaningfully is what Christ provided for you and for me in the cross. If you follow the Islamic faith and you ask a Muslim man, how do you attain paradise? He'll say, when you stand before Allah, your good deeds will have to outweigh your bad deeds. That's how you're going to make it. In fact, a few years ago, I was at Toowoomba at the University of South Queensland, and I was debating an atheist and an um, Islamic scholar. He said that right from the platform. And I put him the question, how do you attain paradise? Your good deeds will have to outweigh your bad deeds. You ask anybody from the pantheistic worldview, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and so on, every birth is a rebirth, every life pays for the previous life. When you finally attain that karmic victory of attaining perfection and paying for everyone, uh, every previous birth, then you attain nirvana or moksha, whatever it is. In other words, you're paying all the way through. You incur a debt with each birth, and you pay for that debt with each rebirth. You look at the story of the prodigal son. This boy goes to his father and is basically telling him, I'm going to treat you as though you're already dead. I want my inheritance now. I don't want to wait till you die. And the father gives him his inheritance. And the boy takes off, squanders it, plunders his own life, finds himself in literally a pigsty out there. And he says, you know, my father's servants are living better than I am. I wonder what he thought. I'd love to go back. I wonder what my dad will do with me. I'll tell you what my dad would have done with me. <laughs> it's true. My dad was from Kerala. He spoke Malayalam. My mother was from Chennai. She spoke Tamil. 
I was raised in Delhi, so I was raised speaking Hindi. I speak Hindi and I speak Tamil. Very comfortable in Hindi, quite comfortable understanding Tamil. The only words I know in Malayalam are words of scolding, <laughs> what my dad gave me. And I, I won't repeat them for you. <laughs> you see, in the culture of India, the father as a patriarch held quite supreme. In many parts of India today, you will still see when the sons or daughters or daughters in law walk in the room, they touch the feet of the dad, first thing. It's a culture that's gone that way for, for centuries. This boy is taking his dad's money, blown it, and he's gonna come back. Would you have ever imagined in an Eastern narrative that the father rushes out of the home to meet him halfway? Totally catching the whole narrative and the listeners off guard. And he comes and wraps his arms around him and said, this my son was dead, is alive, is lost, and is now found. Put on the robe, put on the sandals, put on the ring, let's celebrate. You see, the older brother couldn't handle that because grace misunderstood will always lead to jealousy. And the marvelous thing about the Christian worldview is you can never earn the right to really be embraced by God. It is his gift to you. It is the provision on the cross. And so you're waiting till you're all right and all cleaned up. You're coming the wrong way. You come as dirty as you are. He's the only one who can clean you up. You know, I was, uh, I was telling the folks at uh, Perth yesterday, not at Perth, at uh, Adelaide yesterday, the time I was in Jerusalem, part of a small delegation with the Archbishop of Canterbury, the former Archbishop George Carey. He'd taken the five of us to discuss um, mediation approaches with the Jewish leaders, Palestinian leaders, especially the religious leaders. And on the last day, we are with one of the four founders of Hamas. His name was Sheikh Talal. Sheikh Talal's a pretty solidly built guy. Spent 18 years in prison. Lost several of his children in suicide bombings. We'd spent about three some hours there, had a long discussion. He gave us a great lunch, and now the intensity begins in the dialogue, you know, and he's just clenching his fists, and uh, we're just sitting back and listening to all the venom and all the anger. And as it's coming to an end, the Archbishop looks at the five of us and says, if you men want to ask him one question each, keep it brief, and then we'll move on from here. So my turn came, I looked at him, I asked Sheikh Talal a question, I won't tell you what question I asked. But he gave me the answer and I looked at him, I said, you know, Sheikh, you and I may never see each other again, but I really don't like your answer. I said, I have to tell you that. And I said, I'll tell you why. I said, we're sitting here in Ramallah. I said, not far from here is a mountain. Not far from here. 5,000 years ago, a man you and I respect by the name of Abraham took his son up that mountain to offer his son as a sacrifice before God to demonstrate his faith. Do you remember the story? He said, yes. I said, let's not discuss which son it was. Let's just agree it was the son. He said, yes. I said, and as the ax is about to come down, God stops the arm of Abraham. You remember that story? He said, yes. I said, what did God say? He couldn't remember. I said, God said, stop. I myself will provide. He said, that's right. I said, Sheikh, stone's throw from where you and I are sitting is a hill. It's called Calvary. I said, 2,000 years ago, God kept that promise and took his own son up that hill. I said, Sheikh Talal, this time the ax did not stop. God himself provided. He's just staring at me. I said, I want to say to you this, sir. Until you and I receive the son God has provided, we'll be offering our own sons and daughters on the battlefields of this world for position, land, power, and prestige. There's been dropped silence in the room, and Archb the Archbishop says, I, I guess we can go now. <laughs> oh, I figured I'd done it, you know. So we're walking away, and I'm sort of shoulders hunched, about to go down the stairway, and I feel this arm around me. It's the Archbishop, he said, Ravi, that was of God. I said, I sure hope so. <laughs> and we walked down. And he, was, the Archbishop was the guest of honor. We were sort of part of the hoi polloi accompanying him. And so we are all getting into our car and the Sheikh is ushering the Archbishop to the car. But I notice he's hurriedly putting him into the car and he comes running towards me before I got in. I said, here it comes. <laughs> he turns me around. He's a strong guy. 
and he's holding my shoulders, and I'm looking him eyeball to eyeball. And he said, Mrs. Zacharias, you and I may never see each other again, but you're a good man. You're a good man. I hope I see you again someday. And the tears filled his eyes, and he gave me that hug, and I walked away. Do you realize the Christian faith is the only faith that talks about redemption? Not just forgiveness, redemption. The redemption that comes because of the grace of Christ. Oh, other religions talk about the longing for it, the hope for it, never ever any provision for it. Condition, the provision, thirdly and quickly, his equipment and suffering. I don't have time to get into all of this, but in one of my book, Cries of the Heart, I talk about this extensively and about to co-author a book with one of my colleagues, If There Is a God, Why Is There Suffering? And we think and think and think of so many issues on this matter but I want to just point out to you one or two truths that I think emerge in life. And here's what Muggeridge says so powerfully. Contrary to what might be expected, I look back upon experiences that at the time seemed especially desolating and painful with particular satisfaction now. Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything I have learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that has truly enhanced and enlightened my existence has been through affliction and not through happiness whether pursued or attained. In other words, if it were even possible to eliminate affliction from our earthly existence by means of some drug or other medical mumbo jumbo, the result would be not to make life delectable, but to make it too banal and too trivial and to be, to be endurable. This, of course, is what the cross of Jesus Christ signifies above all else. And it is the cross of Jesus Christ more than anything else that has called me inexorably to Christ. Not far from where I live in Atlanta, Georgia, is a young gal by the name of Ashlyn Blocker, ironically named that way. She has a very rare disease called SEPA, congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. The sweat glands don't work either. SEPA, congenital insensitivity to pain. She feels no pain. If you put a knife into her back, she'll feel no pain. If she steps on a nail, she'll feel no pain. If she puts her hand on a burner, she will not know it's being burned. When she plays sports, she has to have somebody literally watching her back the whole time and examining her body after every game. And her mother was interviewed on CNN. And the mother said, you know, every night I go to bed praying one prayer. Lord, please give my daughter the ability to feel pain. If in this physical world, we find pain is an indicator and a reminder. Is it impossible to think that in the mind of an infinite God, through pain and suffering and other things, that he points us to the reality of what life is all about when we've walked away from him? That's all the narrative and the story. But I want to say to you this that to raise the question of evil assumes a moral law. So you can't raise the question of evil in order to disprove the existence of God. You have to resolve it within itself. And I will just tell you the succor, the sustenance, the peace, the provision that Jesus gives is a remarkable story of a relationship in which he carries you through that pain and suffering. I injured my back in 1985 in a very bad way. And for these 27 years, the last year has been one of my best. That's another story in itself. But after through major, two major surgeries, and as an itinerant, your back is so vulnerable because of travel and all the contortions it goes through. And I found in these decades that my dependence on the Lord every day only increased more and more and more every day to know that this very voice, which is vulnerable, and this very back, which is vulnerable, is all in his hands. And if anybody think we are so sovereign over ourselves that we can do whatever we want, I got news for you. It is only as God sustains you, 
And as God carries you, leaning on him, I think one of the gospel songs there said, it's a new morning, it's a new dawn, and you start that new day to sing the song all over again upon your dependence. His description of the condition, his provision for the malady, his sustenance and support in suffering and pain. But I want to lead you very quickly to the two or three closing thoughts here. His embodiment of the ideal, the purity with which we see him living. You see, for the Hebrews, the ideal was in light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. This is the light that lights everyone that comes into the world. For the Romans, it was glory, the glory of the Roman Empire. For the Greeks, it was knowledge, episteme, truth, understanding. So for the Greeks, it was knowledge. For the Romans, it was glory. For the Hebrews, it was light. The Apostle Paul, who was a Hebrew by birth, a citizen of Rome, and who'd studied in a Greek city, he writes to the church at Corinth, God who caused the light to shine in the darkness has caused his light to shine in our hearts to give to us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus our Lord. He took all the abstractions and put the face to it in the face of Christ. You see, all that is pure and all that is impeccable. Point to me another claimer to prophetic and divine status who would lay that kind of a claim before you. the purity of Christ. And the last thing I say to you is his triumph over the grave. Hope, hope for which we all long, for which we all yearn. You show me a person where there is the death of hope. I will show you a person for whom the only thing left is the hope for death. Hope is what keeps you and me going. Why did I end up on a bed of suicide? I had no hope. Why did I walk away from there? The hope that Christ had given to me, the new hope, the promise of a new day. And you know, the marvelous thing about this thing we call hope is not just that you find it on your deathbed, but that it is the hope that beats within your heart every day that the Lord will not leave you desolate and leave you abandoned. I don't know what you're struggling with today, but if you're beginning to lose hope, or if you're beginning to sense the weariness and the pain of whatever it is you're enduring, I invite you to look at Christ and see how he will sustain you, how he can carry you, how he can give you the new hope and the promise of eternal life. You know, it's an interesting story. Let me close with a testimonial here. When I was in that hospital bed and that Bible is brought to me by a gentleman, the verse that was read to me was from John 14, 19. Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. My mother was the one who read it to me and uh, she herself had no personal knowledge of Christ. At the point, she was a religiously minded person, but she read that to me. And when she was only 57 years old, when we lived in Toronto, my mother suddenly passed away. I was speaking out in Detroit, it's not far away, it's about a four hour drive by car from Toronto. And my th phone rang at three in the morning when I was told my mother had passed away the previous night. I was in a state of shock because if it weren't for my mother, I would never have really made it through the dark days and the dismal days of failure after failure after failure after failure. She somehow believed that was not what was meant for my life. She always hoped there would be something greater, and she kept me going. She really kept me going. So when I arrived home in Toronto, my dad, for the first time in his life, embraced me as I walked in, wrapped his arms around me. And then he says to me, son, I want you to preach at mom's funeral. I said, dad, I really don't, don't, don't think I can do it. It's too heavy right now. He said, I want you to do it. I said, the only word in my mind is the word gone. She's gone. He said, she's gone, son. But I want you to get on your knees and ask God, gone where? And so I went to my room, I got on my knees and just kept thinking, gone, gone, but thinking about that, gone where, gone where? And the thought came into my mind, she's not just gone, she's gone home to be with her Lord. Because I saw the great moment in her life when she turned her life to Christ. And so when the funeral was over and 
my dad asked me to pick a verse to put on her gravestone. I said, why not John 14, 19? The first one time I heard it from her, because I live, you shall live also. So that's great, son. So we had that etched on our gravestone. You know, uh, 20 years go by. I'm in Delhi with my wife, Margie, is from Canada. And Margie says to me, you talked so much about your grandmother's funeral when you were a little boy. Have you ever visited her grave? I said, no, I haven't. She said, let's go and find her grave. I said, are you kidding me? Find her grave in Delhi? <laughs> and so I said, you know, there's only one cemetery, Christian cemetery in Delhi at that time. There's only one. So I decided to go over, take a taxi and go over there. It's on Prithvi Raj Road in Delhi, near the Claridge's Hotel. I remember that. So I saw a guy there. You know, in India, the half slumber position for bureaucrats is constant. <laughs> and so he's sitting there like this. And uh, one Indian cartoonist had a bureaucrat in that pose, sound asleep with files stacked up on the desk saying, matter is under active consideration. <laughs> yeah, anyway, the story is too long. I persuaded him to pull out a register, persuaded him to keep going from the 1950s and so on, even though I couldn't have been that early. Found it in 1955. I was a little lad, saw her name on there. So they found the plot number. I get the gardener and he's digging up because all buried now. And with a shovel and a can of water he's digging, all of a sudden the stone is real, revealed. And the names are getting uncovered there. Agnes D. Monicum, born such and such, died such and such. And as the mud is poured away, my wife grabs my arm and she said, look at what it says, John 14, 19. And Jesus said, because I live, you also shall live. <laughs> Suddenly, like a thread, it come wrapping around. Uh, one verse, Jesus said, because he lives, you also shall live. The hope beyond the grave. In Vietnam, a US Marine handed me this. Lord God, I've never spoken to you, but now I want to say, how do you do? You see, God, they told me you didn't exist, and like a fool, I believed all this. Last night from a shell hole, I saw your sky. I figured right then they had told me a lie. Had I taken time to see the things you made, I'd have known they weren't calling a spade a spade. I wonder, God, if you'll take my hand. Somehow I feel that you'll understand. Funny I had to come to this hellish place before I had time to see your face. I guess there isn't much more to say, but I'm sure glad, God, I met you today. I guess zero hour will soon be here, but I'm not afraid since I know you're near. The signal, well, God, I'll have to go. I like you lots. I want you to know. Look, now this will be a horrible fight. Who knows I may come to your house tonight. Though I wasn't friendly to you before, I wonder, God, if you'd wait at your door. Look, I'm crying. I'm shedding tears. I'll have to go now, God, goodbye. Strange now since I met you, I'm not afraid to die. The resurrection from the dead. That's Christ's hope. And so I bring to you the description of your condition, the provision for your malady, the sustenance to your troubles and hurts, the purity of his life, and the resurrection from the dead. There's a lot more, in fact, if you pick up the book, Jesus Among Other Gods, it's really a completely different approach to the same thing, doesn't deal with these issues. It shows you why he's unique in the religions of the world. And so I present this Christ to you as the Redeemer and the Savior. If you don't know him, I pray you'll get to know him. If you do know him, serve him with all your heart. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done through your son. I thank you for the Redeemer, for the Savior, for the Provider. And may your presence convict every heart. Thank you for the offer of hope and the offer of forgiveness. Deal with every heart. May every heart lunge after you today. In Jesus' name, amen.